annual strategic seminar organized by Transform and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Um, this seminar uh, is a decision to, to give every year the space for left-wing uh, analysis, left-wing proposals that uh, we wish to challenge the neoliberal doctrine and uh, for debate on the most crucial aspects of the European politics and the stance of the left towards it. Um, a few words on Transform for those who participate for the first time in an event of ours. Transform it is the political foundation that is related with the party of the European left. And at the same time, it is a network, and it functions uh, as such, of more than 30 political foundations from more than 20 European countries. Uh, our goal is to bring um, the left forces, namely uh, the left political parties, political initiatives, campaigns, progressive trade unionists, and activists from the social movement uh, together, in order to build a common space for debates and political resistance as well in Europe. We consider this not as the only one, but certainly as a fundamental step for developing a radical strategy um, based, of course, on the interests of the popular classes of Europe. Though, uh, though it was not the common ground 10 years ago, so, uh, before the crisis outbreak, we all uh, now share, I think, the same position that the European integration project was built on a very soft ground that resulted to a multi-level and uh, multi-speed economical and financial, certainly not a political union, uh, where the peripheral economies of it um, are not an accident, but an essential part of uh, this kind of development. In parallel, the Eurozone can, is, is everything but an optimum currency area, uh, just because the multiple speeds of productivity among the countries, but also because of the lack, the intentional lack, of a mechanism that can transfer capitals from the wealthiest countries to the less developed ones uh, in the Union. So, uh, 10 years after the crisis outbreak, we are still not back to normal, but what is normal? Um, the Keynesian capitalism, the welfare state, um, the, um, the collective bargaining, uh, or the, the relation between the raise of the wages with the inflation. No, that was the normal for capitalism back then, and this is now over. The normal now is precarity, flexibility, flex security, minimum wages that do not even cover basic human needs, commodification of all the common goods, and so on and so forth. In parallel, this new normality has transformed um, the planet into a warning ball that politicians nowadays have no idea even how to handle the war refugee flows towards Europe. Imagine what is going to happen a few years from now where we are going to face uh, flows with, mi with climate migrants uh, towards Europe. The reflective response of the politicians, I guess, would be, as it is now, authoritarization, death deals with third countries, uh, xenophobia, in general, the Machiavellian real politic. The left forces, and allow me to be a bit sharp here, have so far failed. And we failed to organize, mobilize, and politicize the European people uh, to fight back neoliberalism and its political representatives. We failed additionally because we could not prevent the far right of becoming a hegemonic uh, discourse and a hegemonic force that actually sets the political agenda of the debate and pushes the whole political spectrum towards its direction. We failed finally because we could not transform all those various and very promising movements, the anti-austerity movement, the solidarity to the refugees movement, um, the ongoing feminist uprising uh, that rose during the crisis to a political subject that serves a common consciousness and uh, a common strategic plan. Many uh, political developments of the recent years have left us puzzled, and that's true. 
the no vote in the Greek referendum in July 2015, um, the, the, the refugee flows towards Europe, uh, the terror attacks in various European capitals some years ago, the Brexit vote, the successes of the far right, um, and I'm referring to the electoral and the parliamentary ones, uh, the Catalonia question, the formation of the German government, and most recently the Italian one, in parallel, the leftist uh, Europe, as we are witnessing, is being restructured and new actors seem to emerge. The, um, the Aura de Pueblo initiative of uh, La France Sumisa, uh, Podemos, Bloco de Esquerda in Portugal, the left part in Sweden, the Red Clean Alliance in Denmark, and the left forum uh, in Finland. Um, aim to form a pan-European front, so to say, left front, that will question the European Union and its inner capacities of reform. Um, on the other hand, we have the 25 of Jens Varoufakis that also presents um, a pan-European platform for left-wing and progressive forces. It is still quite unclear how the left is going to run for the next European elections in May 2019 and um, how this mosaic uh, of factors would look like the, the day after. Though <clears throat> what I, I described so far may sound pessimistic, um, well, we are leftists and we are Marxists, so uh, we know that history never ends. And the left parties will have a specific role to, they have a very specific role that is quite distinct from the role of the social movements, for example. It is that they aim to power, clearly, no matter the different strategies and the different ways as someone may describe on that. To change the balance of class powers, hegemonize the political uh, field, and afterwards to claim action the power. We should therefore develop struggles and be engaged in struggles, because not all struggles are being developed through the left, uh, in every field where the power is organized and activated. That means the local level, the national level, the regional level, and of course the European level. Consequently, there is no such field that is unreformable, because power is a priori reformable and under continuous transformations. As we move from one level to another, indeed things getting harder and more complex, and the democratic space is being decreased. However, this conclusion cannot result to the argument of the, um, and excuse me for the wording, unreformability. If the left claims to be an internationalistic force, then it also assumes, or must assume, the asymmetrical level of struggles and resistance. And the fact that, yes, some fields appear as more privileged to us as others. However, we indeed need to work hard and step by step, both political, uh, politically and ideologically. We have to present a holistic alternative, a new definition of humanity and social relations, and we must present a new vision that people can actually understand, uh, find themselves in it, in, in, this, in such kind of narrative, and embrace it in order to fight for it. Um, we cannot, um, he, the organizers of this seminar cannot um, ensure you that this seminar will give the right answers. Uh, what we want is at least to pose the right questions. So where do we want to go? Um, how will we go there? With whom and why? Let's hope that um, at least we, we, we seek for a small piece of such kind of answers and having in mind that the left, what WIS is for, is to be the political representative of the popular classes, not in general, to their struggle towards social emancipation. Uh, so that's uh, for me. I think that uh, we should now take a bit of time so we can all introduce ourselves. So your name, your affiliation, where do you come from, etc. And then I will give the floor to Connie Hildebrand, who, co who moderates the first panel. I'm very happy to see you again, and uh, 
I know my old and good friends, and I'm very happy to see new faces in the round, and that is very necessary that we have a mix with different people in the room. Uh, one of the very important point of our Transform Strategic Seminar is that we try to bring together experts and politicians, and the mix between both experts and politicians, that is the most interesting thing of our Transform Seminar. What we try to do is to find or to support, to find a strategic uh, way for the European left. That means not only for the European left party, for the whole left in Europe. But we stay here as transform, and so is it clear that we discuss from the point, mainly from the point of uh, the European left party. Uh, our seminar takes place 10 months before the next European elections. And if I remember the time before the last elections, the last European elections, I would say a lot of things changed. Remember to 2013. Obama was at the government. In his speech in Berlin, this war, then 150,000 people, de he declared this goal of the nuclear weapons free zone weapons free world. However, his real policies do not lead to concrete results. A lot of problems were not resolved, are the big crisis that we discuss in the last times. The problems of social question, the new regulation of the bank sector, the question of economic imbalances, the ecological question, the question of climate change, the different conflicts worldwide, especially the Middle East conflict, but even the conflict with, with the Ukraine. In 2013 started the fiscal pact of stability, of coordination and governance in, in economic and monetary union comes into force. The fiscal pact. And after the fiscal pact, a lot of measures in the same direction of neoliberal policy. The consequences were the dismantling of the public services, the reducing of wage and income, the privatization of the public social structure. We need all this. And what was in the left in these times? The big hope for the left in 2013 was the success of Syriza in the election 2012 with more than 26 percent. In the summer of 2013, the Bloc group organized the European Summer University in the stadium of Porto. One organizer was Roberto, and I'm very proud. Roberto, and I'm very proud that you are here on my side. And we discussed a lot of things, of course, the global crisis and as an organic crisis. We discussed the global crisis of capitalism and the different dimension of the crisis, their causes and the consequences of the crisis for the left. And we had in this time a very difficult controversy about left-wing exit from the Eurozone. In the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, we discussed the study of Flasbeck and Lapavice, for example, the system, systemic crisis of the Euro, the true and causes and effective Therapies. The confrontation to this topic was very difficult with the huge of potential of split between the left. Since this time, we discussed a lot of times the plan B. We used not so half power for discussing the plan E. And so we have until today a lot of a lack of discussion, and I hope we can be closer to such kind of link. And in 2013, and that is even also a difference to, uh, today, we discussed the question of top candidate of the European left, and it was clear it was a candidate for the European Commission. It was clear it could be only Alexis Tsipras. Mm. And then we had a very difficult period in this time, also for the left. The Memorandum of Understanding, the cup, was a big challenge, was a big difficulty, not only for the Greece, even for the left in Europe. 
what we try in this time to discuss was the election, electoral campaigning for 2013. This one. And we had two documents for this time, a political document. And when we see or when we hear, and I will remember this today, then we can see the differences and the same challenges what we have today. We formulated six axes in this document. The resist austerity for a new model of development, a new model for social and ecological development, gives the power to the people for citizen revolution, a social Europe for social or Europe for of social and rights, the fair trade with the world refuse the big transatlantic market, a Europe for peace. And it's very interesting when we read again the document on Consist Times because the political landscape, and that is a, a sentence in the document, the political landscape in, the, in Europe remains dominated by the forces of neoliberal consensus, but nevertheless moving very quick, quickly. And the last part of the sentence, nevertheless moving very quickly. That is happened since this times. A lot of things change. And what we want to discuss and what, what we want to clear in this moment is to clear what is changing, what was changing, what is new, what is the new quality of new when we see, when we have the orientation to the global challenges. At the end, for that, we have time more or less to our. There's a lot of problems for this more time. <laughs> but, dear friends, we will start with this topic. And I would say the first speaker to this topic is Renato. Renato from Glocke Izquierda. Everybody knows him in this room. And I'm very happy to hear in, in 25 minutes your solution. For this <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your invitation. It's on? Yes. Well, uh, when you were not listening, I was giving the solution. So now I make my speech on other subjects. <laughs> and, uh, thank you for your invitation and congratulations for organizing this event presented in the text as uh, strategic and programmatic debates, not only analyzing the reasons of our victories or our, or our defeats, but also the fundamental weakness of our narrative and of both of them. I completely agree uh, with the need to analyze the reasons of our victories or our defeats even though sometimes we don't have neither victories nor defeats, our action being too irrelevant to fit in any of these categories. <laughs> anyway, it is important to analyze this question, and perhaps we have not been doing it in the deep, detailed and consistent manner it needs to be done. I'm not going to do it now, for lack of time and of personal capacity, but I would like instead to focus on a fundamental weakness, as you say in the text, not perhaps of our narrative, but certainly on the content of our debates and our publications, a specific point that I think is too often missing, or at least undervalued in our theoretical and critical work. So let's begin by the beginning. The role of the left, the great issue mentioned in the title. Basically, the role of the left is to change society. And what we need to change society, be it to change our country, our city, to change Europe or the world. To make it simple, we just need two things. Ideas and power. Ideas on what to change, how to change, in what direction, etc. And power 
to implement those ideas. If we have good ideas and a strong power, we'll do it. Now I ask you, or better, I have asked myself, from these two things that we need to accomplish our world, the two things we need to change society, ideas and power, which one do we have more and to which one do we have less? Which one do we lack, do we need? I think you may easily agree that what we don't have, what we miss more, is power, not ideas. We have a lot of ideas for changing society. We have books and books filled with excellent proposals. We make seminars, debates, publications. Of course, it is true that our ideas have to be further developed, detailed, fine-tuned, constantly adapted to the new challenges of a fast-moving situation and to the concrete needs and will of the people of each country. All this is true. The ideas we have are still not enough and are still not good enough. But we have already a rich set of ideas and proposals that is the result of years of studies, of debates, of common preparation. What we don't have is power. The power to implement our bright and generous ideas. What is very strange, and I would like to underline this as the focal point of my communication, what is strange is that this thing we lack more and need more, power, far from being the main subject or one of the main subjects of our studies and our debates, as it should be, is quite often ignored, absent of the agendas of most of our meetings and seminars and of the index of our publications. And this is a big problem. Why don't we focus on that? Don't we concentrate more attention on this fundamental question of power? The power of the left, of course. Some of these questions could be, why don't we have power and other political parties in our countries do? What do they have that we don't? How can we gain power? What to do when we arrive to power? How to act once in power? And what can make us lose power once we have it? How to act after losing power? And how to regain it? These are some of the questions that we need to answer. I have to admit, I don't know why we normally don't debate power. It's such a key issue for the land. But I know it's worth trying to find out why. Because nothing happens without a reason. Anyway, I will not enter here into the real core of this debate about power, but let's approach one of the many entries of that building and try to have a glimpse of what's inside. To make things easier, let's limit the scope of our attention. I would suggest introducing here three different kinds of limits to make more maneuverable this quick approach to the problem. Geographically, let's reduce the scope to Europe. We skip the difficulties of analyzing power in Asia, Latin America, Africa, cases that have nevertheless been strongly affecting the people's perception of our left in Europe. Another limit, chronologically, let's reduce the scope to our century. These last 18 years, and we skip difficulties of dealing with all the crucial power experience of real socialism, popular fronts, and so on. And let's limit it politically. Let's reduce the scope to the left, to our left, this political world around the European Left Party, when she held, transformed, and friends. So, what happened in Europe in the few 18 years of this century with the left parties regarding the exercise of power? That would be the question. It is methodologically useful to introduce here yet another partition, to separate experience with left as leading forces and leading persons in government from other experience with left as junior partner in government or in ruling coalitions. 
Of course, apart from these two situations, there are also some different kinds of power when we are uh, just in opposition, for example, not only the power of social resistance, of trade unions and industrial actions, influential power of social movements and citizens' initiatives, but also the power of voting the parliaments when you are in opposition, of par parliaments, national, local, or European. Mariano Rajoy has just experienced this kind of power exerced from the opposition. And the last socialist Portuguese government, when that called the Troika and signed the memorandum, fell down in 2011 by a voting parliament rejecting its stability and growth program. Vote where the Bloco, as opposition and members, participated with a decisive influence. But let's concentrate on the cases where the left parties have been participating directly in power. As junior partners in government, we have had a lot of situations in many different countries and regions, from the north of Ireland to Catalonia, from Finland to Italy or Berlin. The cases are abundant in quantity and very diverse in quality. All of them we should have studied in detail to learn all possible lessons from these rich experiences. I know that they have been object of analysis and debates in the countries concerned. Sometimes very hot debates, like I have witnessed in the Congress of Refundación after the defeat that followed the participation in the Prodi government. This Italian case had such an impact, and we know now, that during, in fact, that it surely has grabbed general attention in many meetings and debates of the left in Europe. But the majority of our power experience as junior partners in governments have not really had the necessary scrutiny at European level. We have not enough exchange of experience in this crucial issue, learning the precious lessons that only real situations of the exercise of power can bring. But let's move now to the situations where our left has been leading governments, because these cases are very few, differently from the cases as secondary forces. We still, this is still only in Europe, only during the 21st century. The century started with a stunning victory of the Communist Party of the Republic of Moldova, winning 71 of the 101 seats of Moldovan Parliament, with the fifth 0.1% of the votes, forming a government, electing also the President of the Republic. After some years of right-wing domination, this was a surprise for most European observers and analysts. In 2005, the Communist Party of Moldova won again elections with absolute majority, 46%, 56 out of 101. In April 2009, the Communist Party wins another absolute majority with 49.5%. Months late, in July 2009, a new election is another victory for the Communists with 44.7%, losing the absolute majority, which allowed the opposition to unite and form a government. In 2010, the Communist Party of Moldova wins again with 39% and 42 seats, but far from the absolute majority. This is the longest period of consecutive victories and the highest electoral scores of all left parties in Europe in the period under analysis of our still very young 21st century. The Communist Party of the Republic of Moldova is a full and active member of the European left and of UE in the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly. For the first time in the 21st century, our left won elections and was ruling a country in Europe. This experience has been for sure very rich in lessons on how to conquer power, how to use power, and also how and why we may lose it. During and after this power experience, had it been the object of debates, of articles, of books, trying to analyze and explain, or at least to provide interpretations on the Moldovan left ruling, the very first European left government in the 21st century, 
said to him, Why endow the one election after election? What their government has achieved for the benefit of the people? Why they lost support? Perhaps this analytical research has been done in due terms and made available to us all, but I must confess I didn't notice it. In 2008, in 2008, while we were still keeping our good electoral results in Moldova, we experienced another success with the election of Dimitris Christofias, General Secretary of AKEL, as President of Republic and Head of Government in Cyprus. Now it was happening inside the European Union. Enormous expectations were raised by the presence of an experienced communist leader inside the meetings of the European Council, where the future of EU is supposedly designed and decided. Namely, taking into consideration that some decisions are to be taken by unanimous vote, giving the European left a de facto right of veto to all key political decisions of the Union that we consider, we would consider negative for people's interests. Christophe's presidency lasted five years. Adding to this, during this period, Christophe's government had for six months the rotating presidency of the Council of the European Union with a, a reinforced role in agenda setting and in the conduction of daily work of the European Union. Now, European citizens were going to be able to appreciate the difference it makes to choose the left instead of choosing the right or the center to rule the government inside the European Union. What has been the extent and profoundness of the debates and analysis promoted by the European left to NGL or Transform about this period of exercise of power in Cyprus, about the real influence of having this government, both for Cypriots and for EU citizens in general? Once again, I'm afraid the debate has been very scarce if any at all. In 2015, with the victory of Syriza, we started the third experience of a left-led government in Europe during this century. The Greek situation has been the object of huge debates in Europe long before Syriza came to power. It was only natural that it would continue to be so after their victory. The international impact of the Greek case is enormous, much more than the Cypriot case and the Moldovan before it. It has been presented to the people, both by us and by our enemies, as an example of what the left party would do when reaching power in a member state of the European Union and namely in a member state facing great economic difficulties and all kinds of pressures and nightmares. The actions and decisions of the EU and the Troika against Greece have been debated everywhere, including in all mainstream media. And the counter-reactions of the Greek government and the Greek people too. But what about our own debate? Did it match the importance of what was at stake for us? Because the importance could not be higher. The entire world was watching Syriza and Alexis. For the first time, our left was at the eye of the hurricane, and great expectations waited every single move in Athens. What was happening there would affect enormously the future of us all. One real risk was that Greece could be swallowed by a catastrophic turmoil of misery and violence. And with Golden Dawn and infiltrated police involved, this could have looked pretty ugly. If it had happened, this turmoil and violence, I think it would have jeopardized any chances of success of all other left parties in Europe for decades. Because 
we would all be facing the argument that voting for us would be voting to bring this same Greek-style chaos, misery and violence to our own countries. So, it's good that it did not happen. But what happened instead has also been quite problematic for us. Because we were so closely linked to Syriza, the right-wing parties downgraded our critique against them, saying, why do you criticize us for obeying the Troika and applying the memorandum if it is exactly what your good friends of Syriza are doing? That's what they were saying. And the immediate consequence was the strengthening of the there is no alternative argument and the reinforcement of the political field using that argument. The apparent lack of alternative had a huge negative impact on the population's state of mind and the willingness to fight back austerity measures. The importance of this situation demanded a more deep, open, detailed and outspoken political debate among us all. But once again, when the question is about power and power of our own people, we have a rather diplomatic, if not timorous, approach. Or else we split. Either we mix up fraternity and solidarity with hypocritical diplomacy and submissive silence, or we handle political difference with sectarian warfare. Well, I think time is almost over now, I think it's... Uh, okay. Reaching my conclusion, I think we can detect in all cases where we have our left related to power, we have a certain pattern of difficulty in dealing with it openly, analyzing the phenomenon in a lucid and critical way, and that is somehow preoccupying. Because although power is, or must be, a key question for any left militant or organization, we strangely avoid debating it, mainly when it happens in reality which is the moment when it has to be debated more strongly and with more accuracy by everyone. We are internationalists. However, we do not intend at all to interfere in the sovereign decisions of all parties when they are ruling their countries. Of course not. But any left power, any left government anywhere, has a strong influence in the popular perception of left parties everywhere. We are all affected, in a positive or in a negative way, by the concrete measures taken by any left party when it conquers power. We know that being the government is not exactly the same as having full power to govern, mostly in cases when we are junior partners in rural coalitions. It can, never, it can uh, even weaken us if we don't have power enough to implement our policies or to block others we disagree with, because at the end of the day, we will be seen as responsible or co-responsible for all measures taken, even if they are not at all identified with us. This was probably the case in several European situations where we were junior partners, <coughs> and uh, I think we should have analyzed the, this with more detail. Every case of power experience by any of our parties anywhere must be a case study addressed by all of our parties everywhere, and it has not been the case. It could make us wonder why have we been avoiding debate about power in general, but especially about the concrete experience of power of our own, own parties of the left. I don't have any satisfactory answer to this question, but I have a feeling that the answer may be important for our movement. Perhaps we still carry upon our shoulders an old poison mix of fear and uncritical reverence towards power, mostly when that power is held by our own comrades. Wasn't it the case in the relation of all parties with the governments of the former socialist countries 
even when things started to go terribly wrong, or today with China, or towards our friends of left governments in Latin America and the Caribbean, when they take attitudes we would never accept in our own countries, or even towards some African governments resulting from anti-colonial liberation wars that we all supported with militant determination, but that later slowly became a bunch of corrupt kleptocrats. Perhaps we still have that feeling that any critique made during these always difficult moments when we rule a country could sound like a betrayal in times of war. So we forgive or we forget everything. If it is so, that's very problematic. And it means it's time to make a revolution in our minds. And always there to ask for the concrete results of our use of power when trying to change things. Because sometimes the use of power, instead of changing society, could be having the effect of changing us instead changing us for worse, rather than changing society for better. It would not be, would not be the first time in history, as you know. <clears throat> so, I finish insisting on my proposal that we start to dedicate half time of our debates and half space in our publications to the question of power. Why we don't have it? How to win it? How to use it? And how it is being used when we have it? why we have lost it in situations where we have it. And I close saying that if you have the ideas, good ideas of course, then all you need is power. Power, power is all you need. Thank you. Thank you, Renato. I think it's a lot of very interesting I want to make some interesting comments in this situation, but I would say it's better if we hear the con contribution of Helmut Schultz, please. Well, thank you, Connie, and uh, thanks to Transform for having invited me to participate uh, in the seminar, uh, which I think is a challenge in um, exchange of views, debate, discussion. I will not make a speech, I will try to make some comments, some proposals, some ideas contributing to the work of the seminar. And as Renato, a good old friend of mine, or not an old friend, but time for long me, uh, I would start to comment two thesis he just contributed, trying to combine it with my, to link it with my my thoughts, my preparation for this exchange of views. Um, I think reducing the left from the global to the European to the national level is a wrong approach. Um, because we as a left have to deal uh, with a concrete analysis of what is really going on around us. What is influencing the concrete conditions of life of citizens, of the societies, in which we as a left has to con contribute to a discussion how to change this reality. I think our task is not in a specific, <coughs> that would be my second remark, <coughs> understanding of changing the society. No, I think we have to contribute that human beings are able to shape their life, their <coughs> position in the society, and by that, the left has to contribute to the emancipation of the human beings for doing so. And here we are in a concrete responsibility, uh, and in the year 2018, when we are celebrating uh, 200 years Karl Marx, we should not forget what he said once, that the proletarians of the, of the countries you should unite. So what does it mean in the concrete understanding of the 21st century 
that we have to include them in this changing world into the concrete political economic strategies for contributing in this task we have. In the year two, uh, 1990, <laughs> the today's American President Donald Trump answered to the question of the German Playboy what he would do first when he would become President of the United States, 1990. And he said, he said if I would be the President of the United States, I would, that's the first measure, to introduce taxes on each Mercedes Benz and on all products coming on the American market from Japan. I, I, I guess it's a very interesting to, to see what is his perception and what he's doing today. And of course, the world changed totally or in a significant way compared to today with the 1990s, in particular also for the left, with the defeat of the real socialism, with the loss of the trust of the citizens in the capability of the then ruling powers to answer their daily needs. And just two days ago, the Prime Minister of China answered to the German newspaper Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, Li uh, Chang, who has today this EU Ch uh, Germany summit, be, uh, ahead of the EU China summit this week, that's Industry 4.0, um, creates uh, new um, um, points on the way in which we have to answer to the growing interlinkages of the world. And that he answers at the same moment when the American president is putting a customs, a new product, Chinese products in particular, which are entering uh, the American market. And where we are living, I think we are already living in a trade war. Mm -hmm. Why I say this example? Because I think the left, and we discussed it several times at the party of the European left, has not understood what does it mean if China has not entered 2001 the WTO. It's the only existing international structure regulating the way of how international commercial policy is carried on. Answering by that on the complexity of the geo-economic and geopolitical challenges in our century. And the left, during the last two, three years, discussed heavily how to react on granting China the 2001 promised um, agreement that they will become the market economy status as it is a basis for functioning of the WTO and the, and the, and the, and the existing rules. The left and broader understanding, including even um, trade union, social democratic parties, etc., argued that we have to be able to secure the labor conditions for our workers, for our labor forces, for our labor forces, for our standards. So, not to grant China this economic state, but also the state influence on the economy. There is an influence of the Chinese party on the state on the, on the issue. So the way we have not discussed it, even in the parliament, enough was that we have really re-questioned ourselves how the market economy 
uh, this function. And obviously, we all agree that uh, China is only one factor in the international uh, world today, which we have to include in our thinking when we are answering such questions of power, such questions of contributing to change the society, of getting trust from the citizens into the forks of left forces to, to show certain proposals, to give certain examples, being in power or being in opposition or being uh, a social um, a movement contributing to the general social debates and debates in all societies. We have, the fact, we have today the question of the Russian Federation, the relationship between the different actors, Again, geoeconomically as well as geopolitically, we have Africa, uh, which will become in the year 2050 the most decisive factor for these geopolitical and geoeconomic developments because they will then have 2.5 billion people living as this continent. And we are discussing today how. I to this. And that leads me back to the, uh, to the initial idea. We sh can't exclude these challenges of thinking for the strategies of the left, determining our place in this global and, in a certain way, also <coughs> regional European. Uh, Processes. Who are the left actors who have today the task to go into this debate, in these discussions? Uh, in the analysis of the, election, of the results of the European elections in 2014, the German party Die Linke analyzed that we increased the votes by citizens around 200 senior votes, senior 200,000 voters supported more compared to 2009 uh, with the Lincoln. Um, and we increased slightly, but we remained under the, the results. Of the, um, of the elections for the German Bundestag. And because in 2014 we had in Germany not any, any longer the 5% level according to the national European electoral law, um, one seat, even if we had gained certain um, seats, uh, certain votes more, one place in the European Parliament. And for the first time, so alternative for Germany and the European Parliament. Um, with a quite significant result. So the, the diversification of the results uh, of the German party has been analyzed. And today we are in a situation that probably in the next year we will have the basis of the voted uh, European electoral law of last week in Strasbourg. The Germany is trying again to introduce a threshold of 2 or 3 percent or in between to, to try to keep out the small parties, which we reject as a German party, but what means that we have to take the contest, the, the, the competition for the vote. In a very, I would say, changed society, we have the, the, the old outcome of all the failures of the European Union policies over the last years, and I would say in decades. When the European Union changed its policy uh, as a basis of the ruling neoliberal uh, philosophy. As I would say today, of the ruling issues uh, of the governing parties, um, 
he had already uh, with the introductory remarks by Connie uh, Hildebrand listened what does it mean for the financial sector, the banking union, the monetary issues, etc. The, the foreign policy, the migrants issue. So are we able to answer with our um, proposals for the next decade of development of the European Union, of the integration, to the question of this global world and just try to describe it in a certain way. And that leads me back again to the question of, uh, of the global value chains. Is the European Union or are national member states of the European Union or other European countries not being members of the European Union yet? Not becoming, even not wanted to become, not wanting to become, able to answer to the frame of the organization of the development of the forces of productivity, which is expressed with the short glimpse of that particular chunk said. So we are living in an era and a phase of the digitalization of the production. And that leads to the question how to set the frame for that for this development of the forces of productivity. And I think the left has to start to discuss the question. In which frame we want to set the limitations for the brutal forms of the market economy, unconditioned, liberalized at all, taking, uh, crushing down the role of the states, the function of the states, to take responsibility for the social and ecological conditions for our survival as human beings. And I think this is the, one of the, the points we have to answer. Um, back to the actors. <laughs> the European Left Party was founded in the year 2004 as a consequence of five years debate among various left parties from, from the European Union, as well as not limited to the European Union, but included already the party of the Communists from the Republic of Moldova at that time, and others, as an attempt to say we need a new force in Europe which is able to participate in developing a strategy for answer such questions. <coughs> from the very beginning, we had a very strong Debate, discussion, and even um, a painful process of exchanges concerning the question do we accept that the European Union as a structure, as a frame for the questions we have to answer, is accepted, or we are rejecting this European Union as structure as it is? leading to a wrong you know, perception of different parties than direction. And I would say, over the years, since 2004, the party of the European left has not finally answered this discussion. This, these questions, what, how do we accept them? And it's not only true for the party of the European left, it's also true for a lot of member parties of the party of the European left. And of other new emerging leftist actors um, in the European Union. The new movements uh, who are answering of the failures of the policy at the national member state level as well as at the EU level, like in Greece, like in Spain, <coughs> it was mentioned. Um, and I would not exclude any country out of this round of, of the circle. And the UNGL, on, and this, 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 this task for the party of the European Union was linked to the question that we said, this, being this actor, developing a strategy, should go beyond the, the borders of the then already existing unified uh, parliamentary group of the left in the European Parliament. Which with the last enlargement, with the pre-last enlargement, 
when the Scandinavian parties became members of the of the European Union, member states, uh, the UNGL was formed as a confederal group between the unified European left of communist, non-communist parties in the more or less western uh, part of the European continent, and then the Nordic we left the joined us, forming such a confederal group, saying we are not obliging ourselves to any a responsibility to take a common strategy. But we are keeping to, to introduce our national strategies into the European policy. And the parties who then agreed to form this part of the European left said, we know it's this way, we need a, a, a structure which is able to develop a strategy. And as we have not answered this question I, I, I put on the table, I would say even the party of the European uh, left, we are on a decreasing level of giving, the, or trying to attempt to give a final answer to this question. Maybe there is a final answer, you know that. But at least to try to create a working process to interfere into the social struggles in our society. Should, should link much more and seriously together these different challenges. And today, the GUE NGL is a very close cooperation of occasionally elected members from national left parties, which, by the result of national elections towards the European Parliament, are in the GUE NGL. Because we want to cooperate, we want to come together, but we are not able to overcome the situation, to be more precise, and to be more responsible in trying to find long-term, mid-term answers on the today's debates in the society, in the member states, as well as the European Union level. And so I miss a certain serious will of cooperating in the working process in this direction. And probably you have discussed it also in Transform or in the party of the European Left, and you will discuss it probably in the next days during the El Summer University here in Vienna, which I unfortunately can't participate because the Parliament is calling for the committee weeks. Uh, I would wish to be here. Um, that one party left the European for the questions and I will just describe. That the power is a complicated issue. And how far the left party is able, under the conditions I described, to continue a certain primarily and basically orientated left curves linked to the question of the left coming from, from Marx, coming from the attempt to participate in changing the path of today's development. Syriza. And uh, in an interview this last week, a member of the board of the Francis Louis expressed that they can't be in a, in a European structure where one party is not able enough to resist to the European pressure among the European Union governing circles. So it is, this is, um, it's erosing the trust of people into their forces. And I think it's a very challenging argument because how a left force is trust building, how trustful we are in our answers, in our political strategies, etc., to the expectations uh, of the citizens, of any single citizen in our society. And we have to persuade people. To trust us, and we have to win. 
much as possible citizen to support the left-wing direction to change the reality. Um, here I'm very much um, in line with Gramsci, and it was also described in the invitation paper for this seminar of Transform. That we have to, to try to take the challenge, the competition for getting people uh, and to influence the uh, hegemony of the left in the society by getting the trust of any individual in the society for doing so. Fourth problem, I want to say, I very much agree with the former commissioner for the enlargement of the European Union, Günther Favoy, who is a member of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. When he formulates today, not being anymore a commissioner, he may be not an uh, active member of the Social Democracy in Germany, hopefully, um, that it would be naive to think that today to put the question of the treaties on the table of discussion inside the European Union. It would, naive, it would be naive to think that this would change of the treaties alone that would be possible today to do so. But we have to keep on to build on the treaties existing. Because destroying the treaties means to destroy the integration. So again, we are coming to Francis Reed when Jean-Luc Mélenchon has formulated the press statement that he wants to destroy to the, the, the treaties. It's an opportunity, but the question is then who is creating the mother Europe? We are formulating. The German party, Die Linke, said we have to rebuild the European Union. We are not saying that we, we uh, neglect the treaty. We want to change the world. We want to change the direction. We want to, to influence it. And I, I would say, uh, maybe I'm coming to this, uh, we are at the challenge of momentum that we have to, have to answer. In which way the left want to contribute to the year 2019 by developing first many answers question of the election for the European Parliament at the member state level, as the European Union level, how to, how to give an answer to this economic, globally, uh, European questions, how we want to live in solidarity with the environment with those who are forced to leave their countries in the African continent for conflicts, for crises, for wars, uh, or for climate change conditions, etc. And we have to clash, or we have to go into the clash with all of those forces who are answering that by the old neoliberal receives. And we have to develop our own new answers to this um, task. Thank you.